Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Please, everyone, make sure that you've joined through your computer, audio, or in the alternate that you call in. Um, there is an alternate phone number for this that you can put your computer on mute and start listening through your phone. Um, welcome to The Road Less Traveled, a path to civil justice for victims of crime. Our presenter today is Mike Haggard of the Haggard Law Firm. Their website is haggardlawfirm.com. Mike is the managing partner of the Haggard Law Firm, and he is a board member of both the National Center for Victims of Crime and the National Crime Victims Bar Association. Mike is one of our most dedicated members and, and truly a passionate attorney, so we are so excited to hear from him. A couple of things. I will be jumping in every so often to answer questions. Um, please type them into the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm not going to ask you to hold your questions, but I will be the one that's jumping in on mic at appropriate times. So go ahead and ask if you have them. Just know that we might not jump in right away. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it on to, jo to Mike. Thank you, Renee. Uh, first of all, everyone, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be with you all today. It's an exciting topic. Uh, you know, it's for me, being a board member of the NCBC is incredibly uh, incredible honor for us and, and uh, great work for, for us to be involved in because you all are on the front lines dealing with crime victims in all different types of situations. And what this uh, seminar is going to be about today is you know, really kind of expanding the rights for crime victims where they may have an opportunity to pursue a civil action. And uh, you know, we're going to talk about the difference between the criminal justice system and the civil justice system. We're also going to talk about a lot of the symbiotic relationship that the two have and how we can look out for, and you can look out for cases where your victim may have rights that can make them whole in the civil justice system, but also maybe make some changes to society. I mean, we all, in everything that we do, are trying to improve society in different ways. And these civil cases have a way of doing that. So I'm going to jump right in. Again, if you have questions, I know we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. I'm going to leave room for that. We're set for 90 minutes. Um, hopefully I can get through this with a lot of time to spare that we can go through that. Or you can prompt questions, as Renee said, ahead of time. So when you, when you talk about trying to advance the slide here, there we go. When you talk about the uh, criminal justice system and the civil justice system, one of the most famous cases that comes to light is obviously the O.J. Uh, Simpson case. We all know the criminal case, uh, and obviously the victims of most people feel did not get their rights served in that case, but then they were able to bring a civil case in that case. And quite simply, that was a civil case that was out of assault against the offender, against O.J., and they won that case and they were able to recover. They weren't able to recover the entire verdict because sometimes going against an individual is not easy because individuals can hide assets, they can do different things, but they were able to get some justice there, not only from a monetary standpoint, but more importantly, public opinion and showing that he was culpable in a court of law. And so we use that as the first example where you have obviously a homicide case in the criminal justice system, and then you have a civil case uh, for an intentional act, a crime, um, that is compensatory in the civil justice system. One of the primary differences is that the burden of proof in a civil case is only by the preponderance of evidence. By weighing a scale of justice by only 51%, versus the uh, beyond a reasonable doubt standard that the criminal courts have. The next example we'll show is, you know, child sex abuse cases that have occurred. And I use an example here of obviously the epidemic that has happened within the Catholic Church. But obviously these cases apply to any scenario where a minor is sexually abused. We can think of a, a child sex abuse survivor coming to one of y'all from it happening at school, from it happening at a summer camp, from it happening with the Boy Scouts or their Little League, 
There are countless examples A daycare. We can think of thousands of them where that may be a criminal case that has a possibility to be a civil case where you might be able to say to that victim, please, please go see a lawyer because you may have rights here. And really, the key to that is when someone is within their role, whether it be role as a priest, unfortunately, role as a little league coach, role as a teacher, when someone's in some type of employment or volunteer capacity and they commit this type of crime, there certainly can be a civil case out of that. Those of you who deal with DUI cases, um, in DUI cases, there often can be what we call dram shop cases, where the DUI offender had been drinking, drinking to excess or was a minor or was habitually addicted to alcohol, where there might be a dram shop case, which really is a over-served case to, uh, against the bar. So you can have someone who's had a horrible, horrible incident where they've lost a loved one uh, to a DUI crash. Uh, but all the every DUI crash should be looked into, not only against the offender and whether they have proper insurance coverage or anything along those lines, but also where were they drinking at? Were they at a club? This was a terribly sad case I'll talk about for one second, where the hit-and-run driver was a bartender who was underage, and the bar she was at uh, overserved her, which they obviously they knew she was a minor. They uh, employed her, had her records, they served her alcohol, and she killed my client, who was on his way to work uh, in the early morning hours, and killed him, uh, and then subsequently was um, arrested. Ironically, in this case, which resulted out of a manslaughter DUI, the bar itself, the insurance company went bankrupt. We we're able to recover from the bar, but we actually were able to bring another case against a road construction company that really had negligently and improperly designed a roadway uh, that was able to give compensation to our client's family. So out of one criminal act, two different cases emerged that are totally separate areas of the law. And so what we'll do today is we're going to talk a lot about some of the intricacies of the law, but I want one overreaching theme to get to everybody on the phone, and that is we're not going to make you all lawyers overnight. Lord knows you don't want to be. <laughs> um, but you. But I think the key is to when you have a victim that's in front of you where it happened at a commercial entity or there may be some type of other remedy involved for you all to try to get um, that case to some lawyer who could possibly handle the issue. Um, so when we talk about these two judicial systems being interrelated, we all know that in the criminal system, you know, one of the absolute benefits is that hopefully there's an arrest and hopefully the offender is punished. Obviously, no, then we get closure if we have those two things happen, closure for the victim, and obviously, hopefully, dangerous people are removed from society. Um, the civil system, which works right along with the criminal system, uh, obviously, one of the great advantages is that so many of your victims are going through so much. And yes, we have social net uh, funds that are available. We have different things, but a victim can be fully compensated through the civil justice system. The medical needs are handled if you have someone who had a terrible injury. Um, if you are dealing with a homicide case, can provide the victim's loved ones with the resources to grieve and to move on with their lives and obviously replace lost income. But it can bring about societal change. I mean, if you think about the first couple of cases we talked about, you know, when you when you talk about the child sex abuse cases, the changes that have occurred in these different organizations are incredibly impactful. Now you have the National Baseball Little League doing background checks because of cases in the past. You have changes 
that are happening within the church, changes happening within schools to do background checks, to observe inappropriate relationships that may be going on between children and their teachers and superiors. So it can have a lot of impact on society in general. Uh, when the criminal and the justice and the civil justice system work together. And obviously, you can hold corporations responsible, both financially and publicly, which is key. When I go through different cases, I'll talk to you about not only how it came about in the criminal context first, and not only what the civil justice system was able to do, but most importantly, what society can then do so we don't have these incidents occurring again and again. As we all know, you know, until recent time, there wasn't a focus on the victim. Um, over the last 20 to 30 years, that has changed. And there have been advances uh, with regard to the victim within the criminal context. Obviously, all of you, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there, there weren't victim coordinate, coordinators and advocates to work with victims. We're going to talk about domestic violence cases today, which so many of you see in your daily daily jobs and how we can possibly get a civil result, not suing the deadbeat uh, domestic violence abuser, but where that domestic violence occurs and whether or not the uh, apartment complex or the restaurant could have stopped it and been on notice of it. Obviously, we now have crime victims compensation uh, through all these victim rights that have occurred. Um, and, and, and you all deal with the Crime Victim Bill of Rights and Criminal Orders of Restitution, but obviously here we're going to talk about a bigger picture of trying to get them compensated in a bigger way through the civil justice system. I attach here just, you know, the Florida Crime Victim Bill of Rights and what's changed for us. Obviously, I'm located in uh, Miami, Florida, and we have fought long and hard, as many as you had across the country, to get the rights of victims to match up with the rights of the accused. And it hasn't been easy because our, obviously our country is founded, the constitution was founded on protecting the rights of the accused, but we've come a long way with regard to that. And I can tell you in the civil justice system, um, the victim has a lot, much more power. They control timing, they control the arena, uh, they control when they file, where they file. There are some limitations. For instance, when you deal with a sexual assault case, there's a lot more protections for sexual assault victims in the criminal courthouse than there is in the civil courthouse. Because in the civil courthouse, you bring about your damages, your medical conditions. So obviously, you're going to be deposed and your records will be obtained. There isn't a rape shield law that applies to a civil case. And that's something that every lawyer should consider when bringing a case. Again, I, I feel the role of the crime victim advocate is to explore the option with the victim because they can go and talk to any lawyer for free and make those decisions then and there about whether they want to bring a case or not. Um, you know, we've talked briefly about crime victim services and uh, the division of victim services and whether you can get uh, funds from your local attorney general offices in wrongful death cases and also with regard to medical bills and with regard to um, uh, lost wages and those types of things. Um, that's something that most of you all are trained in and that you certainly advise your victims of and within your offices. I know that you have procedures to do that. Sometimes I'll hear crime victim advocates say, well, well, we already got compensation. Or a victim will tell me, well, I got compensation. I got that $25,000 and everything along those lines. And, and obviously in the civil case, this has nothing to do with that. Totally separate. You may have to pay some of it back, but obviously in, in, in a lot of these civil cases, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars or in the most serious cases, obviously millions of dollars of recovery when you're talking about a catastrophic injury or a wrongful death case. And again, 
the civil justice system does not replace the criminal system. They go hand in hand. One of the questions that I'm most often asked is, well, we have to wait for the criminal uh, case to get done, right? To bring a civil case and nothing could be further from the truth. Now there are strategies involved. And again, that's for the lawyer to determine. Um, most of our cases, which we're going to talk about in terms of negligent security cases, we file them before an arrest. We file them when cases are open. We may file them when co cases are closed. We rarely ever wait for a guilty or not guilty verdict um, because the bottom line is our case will be against a corporate entity, usually in these cases. So while they work together, they do not limit each other in any way uh, unless there's a real rare circumstance. And again, that's where the civil lawyer will certainly be talking to the state attorney, the police involved, about mutual concerns. I could point to two or three cases where there was not an arrest. And because of the statements we took in the case, we opened our file to the homicide detective, and we've had three separate occasions where an arrest was made because of information in our file. And that's something we take great pride in and, and why we have such an open relationship with the prosecutors and with the uh, police officers working the case for the victim. Hey, um, Mike? Again, yes. There's a question that you might be in later, but I think it's an important one. Um, we have someone who works in the juvenile court system and handles violent crimes against persons. We're talking about defendants. They would like to know, can a juvenile 16 years or younger be sued in a civil matter, or does it have to be by proxy of their parents? Uh, that's a great question. And so, again, just one thing I want to differentiate. We're going to talk about it a little bit. So you're talking about in a case where you sue the offender. And, uh, and so we'll be talking about those type cases. Um, but we're also going to be talking about cases where you're suing either the employer of an offender or total separately where an incident occurred. So, for instance, if you want to sue the offender and they're a minor, usually you will bring in the parents. Um, you know, you will bring them in as the guardians. You don't always have to, but you may do that for a couple of different circumstances. One a minor doesn't have certain rights, and so you may want the parents in the case. Uh, number two is say the offender did something in there, they did it at their house. A 16 year old sexually molested an 11 year old at the 16 year old offender's house. Well, then you would want to bring in the parents because number one, they own that house and they'd be responsible. Number two, they might have homeowner's insurance that would apply. Um, you know, I've had cases where a a 16 year old has bullied and, and beaten up a um, a minor at a private high school, and, I, and obviously I brought in the parents because not only did I bring the case against the high school, but we brought it against the minor through their parents. And a mi and obviously a minor is not going to have assets, so that that'd be the answer to that question. That's an excellent question. Um, Going again to this slide is that, you know, remember one thing about the civil system, for instance, for that example, is that 16-year-old minor in the criminal case, that case has to be proven beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. That's not the case. Same facts in a civil case, it's the preponderance of the evidence. And obviously the reason is in a civil case, you're trying to get the victim compensated, whereas in a criminal case, you're trying to take away life or liberty. So the burden is going to be that much higher. Um, and we've talked about this. The victim maintains control in the civil case where they're trying to hold responsible parties liable to them. This is so important. Um, in every state, when you are bringing a personal injury or a wrongful death case, the victim does not have to go in and give a $5,000 retainer. They don't go in and, and pay a lawyer $250 an hour. It is contingency based. And what that simply means is if the case resolves and settles or it's tried and there's a jury verdict, the lawyer only gets paid 
from a percentage of that recovery. The percentages change in every state. Usually it's about a third, might be 40%, depending on the circumstances. But what's most important about this is that every victim, when they go to a lawyer, gets a free evaluation. You can go to a lawyer who turns the case down and go right next door and have another lawyer look at the case, and there's no charge. I think that's incredibly important because victims and everyone always thinks, wait a minute, why is a lawyer going to look at my case, investigate my case, put money in my, into my case, and then turn it down? And the reason is because we have to pick the right cases. And so we have to evaluate them, and the victim never pays anything in this type of situation unless they win. And so if there are any questions about that at the end, I'd love to answer them. But that is so important because it has to be one of the number one deterrents as to folks don't go see a lawyer because they don't have the money to pay them. But the fact is they don't have to. Um, so I want to talk about different areas of cases that you all are seeing that could result in a civil case. I and mean, that's really what we're here to talk about. You know, we talked about the DUI. And the possible defendants are obviously the driver, um, the owner of the car, the employer. If someone is driving their car and they're making sales calls for, you know, whatever company, Amazon or whoever, and, um, and they cause a crash and they're drinking, that employer could be responsible. And again, a bar, a restaurant. Uh, a hotel, anyone who has served alcohol to them could be responsible. And those laws change in every state. But again, the point is to get the victim to a lawyer who handles these type of cases. Supervision of minors with child sexual abuse, anyone, anyone who has a minor under their control, whether it is a school, a camp, anything along those lines will be responsible here. Um, and so we, we I, I don't want anybody to lose sight of that. And, and one thing that is happening more and more is possible Title IX cases against universities, against high schools, against against different types of uh, of educational centers. And this revolves again around child child sexual abuse. Uh, and, and and by the way, adult sexual abuse as well. For instance, in colleges where really it's based on discrimination, sexual dis dim discrimination, an investigation that is not handled appropriately under federal law. And these cases are becoming more plentiful and they're very, very important because they show a practice by these educational institutions. I think that's something that when you have someone who's been abused uh, sexually in any situation, educational environment, please get them to a lawyer who does Title IX or could get them to a lawyer who does that. And we might revisit that a little bit because we're handling one right now against a local school board um, that really has turned into something that's going to change how our school board does business forever, hopefully. Uh, and again, when you're talking about violent crimes, whether it be homicide, whether it be sexual assault or battery, we're talking about what we're going to call today negligent security, where a premises a commercial property, any type of commercial property does not provide adequate security, that victim may have a case. And we're going to go over a couple of different properties to make this crystal clear and show you that any commercial property can be responsible for this. And finally, obviously, one of the scariest um, and really most prolific problems we are facing in this country is human trafficking. And those of you who are dealing with it know that these are occurring, these cases, at commercial properties. They are not occurring at any, any high percentage at someone's private house or anything like that. These folks are using, these traffickers are using motels, truck stops, and other places to uh, traffic their victims and these commercial entities should be and have to be responsible if we're going to stop the epidemic of human trafficking. 
You know, the reason I would encourage all of you to get these cases and these victims immediately to a lawyer is there a statute of limitations? Florida, this is only Florida. So if you're writing this down and you're in Maryland or you're in Georgia, please, this only applies to Florida, but there's going to be a statute of limitation that applies to your victim in these cases. So as soon as you think there might be something, please get them to a civil lawyer so that that civil lawyer can evaluate this issue first and foremost. I can't tell you how many times we've had a case where we've had to turn it down because it was too late. And, and it's it's really brutal to tell a family that if you could if you would have come to me six months before, three months before, I think you really had a case and I would have been able to take care of your medical needs or taking care of your family. But the statute civil statute of limitation, again, the civil statute of limitation ran. And so please, please get them to a lawyer as soon as you can. You know, the question sometimes come up, well, who has the case? Well, if someone is injured, it's that person, and it's a personal injury case. If someone has passed away and it's a, a you're handling a homicide case and you're dealing with homicide victims, it's their estate and their statutory survivors. What I tell victim advocates is, don't worry about all that. Half, half lawyers, the lawyers that send me cases have no idea who a statutory survivor is. They send me the sister. They may send me the aunt who may not have a claim. The lawyer, the civil lawyer will find who the statutory survivor is with. Whatever contact you have with the family who you are dealing with through the homicide case, that's who you get to a civil lawyer. So again, it's their job to figure all that out. You're, I think the role we're talking about here is when you think there's a case or there could be any hint of a case, send them to that civil lawyer. Because again, going back to the contingency fee, that civil lawyers really got to figure it out on their own and you're not going to waste their time. So that's really important. What claims can a plaintiff bring, your victim? Well, in civil cases, they can be bring claims for lost wages if they've been out of work for a long time because of an injury, or what if they can't work in the future or their earning capacity is affected by the case, affected by their hand injury when they're a nurse and they have a hand injury because of a stabbing. They could have an earning capacity that could be quite significant. Someone may lose the support and services of someone who passed away. Obviously, medical bills, funeral expenses, and most of all, in any type of trauma-based injury, there's going to be pain and suffering, which included in that is obviously post-traumatic uh, uh, post -traumatic trauma and all those types of issues. And every state's a little different with pain and suffering or the loss of the capacity to enjoy life. But again, the emotional and non-economic damage in these cases can be quite significant. So the first type of cases we're gonna talk about uh, are what we call negligent security cases. And again, this is where when someone is injured by a criminal assailant, whether it be with a gun, whether it be with someone's fist, whether it be with a knife, um, at a commercial property, they may have a claim for that commercial property not providing appropriate security. And in those cases, we have to prove, as the civil lawyer, we have to prove that the civil defendant should have foreseen that this would happen. Well, what does that mean? What it means is that if you, if, if someone is shot and killed in an apartment complex that had multiple robberies, multiple burglaries several years uh, beforehand, they should have been on notice of that. Um, and if they had poor lighting, if they had access control problems, uh, then they should have had the proper security to prevent this incident. And that's really what a negligent security case is based on. And when I say every type of commercial property can be on the hook for this, I mean every type of commercial property. And we'll go through these in more detail 
to show all of you um, how these come about. But you, any violent crime that you have at an apartment complex, a hotel, a bank, a shopping mall, a gas station, a strip mall, a restaurant, a barber shop. Uh, we now have one. Some of you may have seen this in the news of about a year and a half ago now, where in Tallahassee, Florida, um, an active shooter, uh, a uh, involuntary celibate, went into the hot yoga in Tallahassee um, and shot and killed uh, a college student and a college professor and shot a number of other people uh, in a hot yoga class. In a strip mall that had barely any violent crime ahead of time. Well, why would that hot yoga be responsible for that? Well, the assailant um, went into the hot yoga with jeans on, with a yoga mat that had a tag, um, asked the receptionist, is this your busiest class of the day? He looked out of place, strange question to ask, didn't look like someone that was really into hot yoga with a new with a new yoga mat with jeans on. But then he went outside and he paced frantically for over 10 minutes outside the hot yoga studio. He came in there, pulled out his automatic weapon, and committed two murders and shot several people. And that is a very actual case, a case that we're actively litigating right now in Tallahassee, Florida, where any sense of common training to the receptionist, to that company would be, if you see someone out of place, someone um, pacing frantically outside, all you have to do is call the security at the strip mall to get someone to respond. And that's a case that I think may have been missed uh, by a lot of people uh, if they don't get them to a civil lawyer. Just, you know, the basis of these security cases are that whoever owns any premises you can think of has a non-delegable duty to provide safe premises. They have to inspect for and remedy dangerous conditions and they have a duty to take reasonable measures to deter and prevent reasonably foreseeable criminal activity. And here's the law. The law is that a court will determine and now instruct a jury that the circumstances at the time and place of the incident involved in this case were such that a defendant, whatever the defendant is, again, had a duty to employ reasonable security measures to protect the victim from reasonable foreseeable criminal activity. And I show that to all of you because what that really says to everyone is if a violent crime occurs on any commercial premises, that case should be evaluated by a civil lawyer. Because we're not going to know, and you're not going to know, nor would a victim know the past criminal history at that McDonald's or the past criminal history at that movie theater or at the laundromat, nobody knows that offhand. That has to be researched. And if there is something there and they didn't provide proper security or their lights were out that night or they had just fired a security guard and didn't replace them, there's now a case for that victim. And you're not going to have that information, nor would the victim, when this happens or when the criminal case is going on. Nobody would have that. Nobody is going to be pulling a crime grid or the 911 calls prior to this incident, ahead of time. If, if, if we were all together in a seminar and we decided to go to the Applebee's next door to the hotel, if we weren't doing this over the phone, we wouldn't all check and see, well, how many robberies has this Applebee's had? So this is something, this is where the civil lawyer comes in. If you, you all get this potential victim to them because then that civil lawyer has to do this investigative work. And again, it's free to the victim. Hey, Mike, um, just to interrupt yes. you quickly. There's a question. Is 401.13 for Florida only? And I will add, do you know of any other states, if it is Florida, that have a similar um, rule? 
Great question. Great question. Anytime if people want to write down, you know, hey, is that Florida only for any of this? I will absolutely answer that. This comes from a Florida case, but I can tell you handling cases all over the country, and we've handled cases as far as California, we've handled negligent security cases in probably 20 states. The law is that the premises has to provide reasonable security measures. And, and that's, that's pretty much in every state. That jury instruction in particular is Florida, uh, but in every state, they have to provide a reasonable security measures. Now, in some states, um, to prove foreseeability, meaning, meaning what level of crime do you need for them to be found negligent, it differs in different states. Most states are what we call totality of the circumstances. What that means is, you know, you don't need necessarily prior robbery or violent crimes. You may just need burglaries. And that, and that, that kind of goes by state by state. But generally, it's a totality of the circumstances. Um, we do have states. If somebody's on from Texas, unfortunately, the Supreme Court in Texas has said that you need a similar crime. And I don't want to oversimplify it, but... Basically, if you have a homicide, Texas requires that you have a prior homicide, which obviously is a terrible law because it essentially gives a state a free a free murder at a property. And I uh, work with a lot of Texas lawyers. We're trying to change that. Um, but that's probably the most draconian. Everywhere else, um, that's not the case. This right here, the slide we have before us is McDonald versus Merrill Crossings, which is a Florida case. And this says that the property owner cannot blame the perpetrator, the bad guy, and add them to the verdict form. So what this means is, for instance, let's use my Tallahassee hot yoga case as an example. In Florida, the defendant, the hot yoga place, the defendant, the shopping center can't blame the shooter. The shooter killed himself after. Um, they can't blame him and say he's 90% at fault. He's the one who pulled the trigger. We are one of the only states who has that. But I will tell you, having worked through the NCBBA, the National Crime Victim Bar Association, with some of the finest lawyers in the country, we're not worried about that. Because in, in other states, uh, the lawyers have been able to argue, and, and myself and my partners in cases we've handled in states where they can blame the bad guy is, that it makes no sense. The bad, the bad guy should be dealt with in the criminal courthouse. And I'll say to juries, that's why we have that beautiful courthouse across the street or, you know, whatever the situation may be, the courthouse down the other part of town. That's where the criminal should be dealt with. And most juries understand the criminal doesn't have any money. In this case, about compensation. Why am I going to put 80%, give a million dollars and put 80% on the criminal? I, I should just give the victim $200,000. So, this issue has been dealt with really well by victims' attorneys across the country. Um, you know, just to talk briefly, you know, one of the reasons these cases have become so good for victims the last couple of years is because after September 11th, you know, the security industry has become one of the fastest growing industries in the United States. And what happens with that is every type of commercial entity you can think of, right here we're talking about convenience stores, has their own industry standards now. So, for instance, this is just for gas stations and convenience stores that, you know, training and robbery deterrence, safety for each retail employee, um, convenient, what, when are additional security measures required? So, right here... This is the Convenience Business Security Act. It's actually, again, in Florida. But these are the industry standards for convenience stores and gas stations, where when, if they have a murder, a robbery, sexual battery, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, kid, kidnapping, uh, that they need to have either a security guard or two employees on duty or different security measures in place. And I can tell you, Every type of entity we can think of, apartment complexes have regulations, 
Hotels have regulations. Restaurants have regulations. So again, it's so important. If you have, you've got a robbery case where someone was held up and now they're going through tremendous psychological trauma counseling. If they're held up at a gas station, get them to a lawyer because they're going to be these standards that they most likely violated. And again, not your job to look up the industry standards, but to get them to a lawyer who hopefully understands what to do here. So again, who does who does the victim sue? You know, we talked about that 60-year-old minor that one of the folks had a question on. You know, well, the question is, where did that 16-year-old minor commit the offense? Or are we just going against the 16-year-old minor? Um, again, when you go against, we'll call that the first party, the, the defendant, really the offender, okay? So you can sue the offender. You can sue other people that were with them. Again, supervising parents or custodians, okay? When I say custodians, you know, you could have a 16-year-old at a summer camp uh, sexually assault them or beat somebody up. Obviously, the summer camp is going to be responsible for them. There are drawbacks with that because most criminal defendants don't have financial resources, or if they do, they're going to transfer them as soon as possible. And a lot of states don't have good uh, fraudulent transfer laws. So it becomes very hard at times impossible to collect against an offender. That's why I'm here really to talk to you about the third party defendant corporations, institutions with a legal duty to keep people safe for their negligence. Okay, so, you know, Walmart, I can't tell you how many Walmart cases we've had. We have one going on right now. We all know about the Penn State case where the uh, Sandusky, Coach Sandusky was allowed to do what he was allowed to do for so long. And Penn State obviously was found responsible in that case. Uh, Marriott, 7-Eleven, BP, any bank robbery, I can tell you we've had several actual bank robberies and more importantly, ATM cases. You know, there is a reason and only one reason that ATMs don't have security guards at them. There probably is nothing more dangerous if you really think about it than having a machine that dispenses cash out in the open any time of day, and any time of night with no one there to protect it. You know, I mean, it really, if you just boil it down to that, how dangerous is that? And the only reason that banks don't have security guards there is because if they put up one, they'd have to put up every one at every single ATM in the country. And I, we've been very, very successful in those cases. So if you have one of those, God forbid, it's a wrongful death case or uh, a catastrophic injury case or a severe trauma case, get that to a lawyer, please. Obviously, the benefit is provides medical and other resources to the victim. And again, it's able to prevent future bad acts. I can tell you, I can't tell you the name of the bank because it was confidential, but it's a bank in America with a similar name uh, where we've had several of these cases. And the great thing that's come about it is an evaluation by banks as to when they really should have their ATMs open and looking at the robbery patterns at those banks. And so, you know, we don't know every time a, a bank robber, an ATM robber gets deterred, but we know those cases have made a difference for future victims. Again, and I'm going to try to speed up because I, I, I certainly have a big presentation for you all today, but um, the tools for proving these negligent security cases, and I show this to you because this is kind of a template for you to get again that victim to a lawyer because that lawyer then should get the crime grits. What's been happening at that property? What's in those police reports prior to your victim being robbed? Um, talking to those police officers that have been there before and all those type things. And that's the investigation that a civil lawyer will be doing for free for your victim. Um, other ways that this can help the victim is that, you know, there's something called med pay that every insurance policy has. It's automatic. It's usually it's about $5,000. It goes right to the victim to pay for really anything, medical bills, funeral bills, anything along those lines. 
as all of you know, if you're a victim of a violent crime, you know, you, you cannot be deported. And so immigration status is obviously a key issue in our society right now. And so for victims who have immigration immigration status issues, this is incredibly important. We always work with the police and the state attorneys. We can help with that process. Um, and obviously it can help with unsolved crimes as we talked about. So let's talk about particular cases that I think can give you all even more insight as to how these cases work. So I'll go through a couple different scenarios. This is a case where a, where a, a shooting happened at a shopping mall. Okay, this is the layout of the shopping mall. And we talked about earlier, someone asked a question about that jury instruction. Is that the law everywhere that a landowner has the responsibility to provide security? And it is. But these, how, these are how these cases work out. You're gonna see a clip of what the landowner thought the law was in this case. Uh, uh, we got a little problem there, so we'll try to fix this. I press enter. Yeah. Okay. But what, what we're going to talk about here um, is that the um, – the shopping mall owner here said that they had no responsibility as to uh, any type of security. And uh, when they said that, they quite frankly totally violated the law. And, uh, and that's not the law, uh, obviously, anywhere. So we're trying to restart up the computer. I don't, Renee, everybody can still hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And we are on the, this is a negligent security case with a parking lot screen. Okay. Oh, are there, and now are there we're any, not on any screen. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know what happened on my end, but I was going to see if there were any questions pending. Maybe I could ask those. Um, there, what great timing there is. So we're going back right. to the juvenile question, and it's a hypothetical. So if a violent offender is released from a juvenile detention pre-adjudication, placed at a non-secure residential facility per court agreement, he absconds and commits another violent felony offense in the community. Can the residential facility be held responsible? Also, interesting sovereign immunity question, can the juvenile court be held responsible? Well, great question. So, and again, not knowing what state we're talking about and those kinds of things, um, the um, if it's a private, facility that they were sent to. That facility then has responsibility totally um, to the, uh, for that particular, I'll call them assailant because, you know, we know eventually they're an assailant. So they've, they've got to handle anything they do inside and anything they do outside, you know, and they, they have the custody for them. What's interesting there is, you know, they're already on notice, obviously, that um, this, offender has problems. Um, what you've got to watch out for there is sometimes there is immunity, what I'll call the prison immunity. So for instance, at least in Florida, and I think most states, if somebody, you know, escapes Alcatraz and they go to, um, and, and they get out and they swim across San Francisco Bay and they cause a crime, there, there are some limitations whether you can bring a case against that person but that's kind of a sovereign immunity issue more than anything else so if you're dealing with a private facility that's contracted with a state or a county uh, then, then there will be responsibility and that's a great question in terms of the juvenile courts uh, all courts generally have uh, immunity and uh, so there wouldn't be a case there Mike, while we're on this break, um, can you actually, because I use the word and should not have, can you explain sovereign immunity quickly to everybody um, and, and give the implications? Because I think we have quite a few government folks on here, so it would be good to hear what sovereign immunity is for them. Absolutely. And again, it differs in every state. You know, for instance, I'll give the, the, the most simple example first, and that is you know, in the state of Florida, we have sovereign immunity, which basically means the government, any type of government, 
uh, is um, you know immune from liability to some extent. Okay, and it's kind of they call it sovereign immunity because you you you're not supposed to sue the king under old English law. So Florida has limitations where you can sue them, but you're limited with caps. So if you have a trip and fall on the sidewalk in the state of Florida, whoever the entity, it could be city of Orlando, it could be the state of Florida, you have some limitations. In New York City, there's a pothole. You can sue the government for any amount of money. And it, it some states, you can't bring any type of case against any government immunity, and some you can, and there's limitations. Again, get that case to a civil lawyer. Uh, but prosecutors across the country, judges, the courts are generally sovereign immune. So are we back up on the screen? You are back. We are looking okay, at a picture let's... of Alex Cologne. All right, well, let's see if Alex will talk to us real quick. I'm a little scared to press the button, <laughs> but I'll do it. Is it your belief as you sit here today that Sunset Owner and Continental had no responsibility for security on that property? No, we did not have any responsibility. Okay, so that's what a majority of owners, believe it or not, will say. We have no responsibility. And that's dead wrong. And that case at that point in time is over. Absolutely over. Um, and so, again, just to show all of you, I, you know, I want one thing I want you to take away from this is that you know, and, and usually this is what I say to lawyers. I mean, these, these folks that run commercial entities and provide security, they're in it for one reason, that's to make money. And, uh, and so these cases can be very good for your victims. And what we find out generally is what was going on on these properties. And if you can imagine, this is what we show to a jury. When somebody says he has no responsibility and nothing was going on and there were never any crimes, we'll show some graphic like this to a jury you can imagine, you know, when somebody says they don't have a responsibility, that's going to be a successful case. Um, you know, we're going to get all the police records, and you, it shows that there were drug things there all the time. And, you know, all these problems, the jurors are like, you got to be kidding me. How, how were they running this place and not knowing there could be a potential shooting? And there was, in this case, someone lost their life, and thank God we were able to recover a, uh, a nice result for them. Again, we've talked about gas stations a little bit. This is a case where our client was asked to um, do a car wash at the uh, Valero gas station in Miami, Florida. He was robbed of the cash for the car wash and shot and killed on this property. This is the testimony of the director of the gas station about prior crimes and whether they had been occurring there. So many. <laughs> What's going what to say? With so many incidents, I mean, how can I? So you can imagine that we might have won that case when uh, the owner of the gas station is laughing about how many incidents occurred. And, you know, this was a case that uh, came to us through the homicide detective because, you know, the, the homicide detective who, you know, we had met through just community activities said, wow, you know, I've got a case where someone was shot and killed at a gas station. We were going forward with the criminal case. We've got the two assailants, but it's in a really bad part of town. Would that be a case? Now, that detective didn't have um, this testimony where the, uh, the family food saver operator said she knew it was a dangerous area and knew her customers were at risk. Um, she knew people were repeatedly getting robbed. He didn't know she was going to say that. He just had a feeling that it was in a dangerous area. And so, thank goodness, we were able to provide through a jury verdict for uh, the two children of our decedent in this case. And there were four prior armed robberies at this gas station, and they then put up a pop-up car wash, a cash business in this very dangerous area. So, again, I don't want you all to think you have to know it's a dangerous area. Um, just if it's at a gas station, go talk to a lawyer. A lawyer may say it's not a case. May say under Colorado law, Minnesota law, you know, there's not that type of case. So feel free, obviously, to always email us. We will either, if we, if we feel we can handle the case in that state, or we will get it to someone 
who's in the NCBBA who can handle the appropriate case. This is a timeline just showing all the deficiencies of this particular uh, gas station here. I won't bore you with all of it, but it was, it was pretty bad. Surveillance cameras never, ever, ever worked. This is a residential case. Now, I, sh I showed this to you because I'll have referral lawyers that send me cases, you know, say, well, I didn't want to send you that case because it happened in his private home. Makes sense, right? If something happens in your home, who's responsible? But remember, a lot of these homes are within communities, are within HOAs, that the common areas are controlled by a homeowner association. Um, so this was a case that a referral lawyer said to us, I don't think it's a case, but if you could look into it. And we did. Our client was robbed in a um, home invasion. He was a flight attendant. He gets home about 11 o'clock at night, walks inside. Someone comes downstairs who'd been robbing his house, shoots and renders him a quadriplegic. Um, you know, there, there were crimes in the area, which I'll show you in a bit, but this was the Homeowners Association uh, presence memo to the police that we only discovered once we started taking depositions and commencing discovery in the case. For the past two years, the crime rate has been escalating due to the fact that we do not have any protection whatsoever. We have been getting hit with burglaries and thefts. Things are getting worse. So you can tell a lot of times you might have some folks uh, running these places that uh, don't really know what they're doing. These offenders have the green light to come into Bali. That was the name of the uh, complex, the residential community, community, anytime they want because of the lack of security. And that was from the actual president of the Homeowner Association. And there were 21 prior burglaries at this community and nothing was done. Um, so again, it's, you know, I, I almost say to people, no matter where it happens, I mean, unless it's in the middle of a public street, have them talk to a civil lawyer because you never know. And he was a quadriplegic. And if he had gone without talking to a lawyer, um, he would have to, he wouldn't have the wheelchair he has now that actually is rehabilitating him every day. Um, he wouldn't have the house for him and his son that's handicap accessible. Um, he wouldn't have any of the needs that he has today. That case resulted in a $18 million settlement that I can tell you people think that sounds like a lot of money. His wheelchair itself is $85,000. has to be replaced every five years. His handicap van that he takes his child to to uh, school in every day, you know, is $250,000. And Medicaid and those type of things, and insurance companies don't pay for those. So it was critical that he got that type of result and uh, in that case. Again, we've talked about child sex abuse cases, and this was a case I handled many, many years ago where Sports Illustrated ran an article where volunteer coaches in the National Little League we're not required to go through background checks. And Norman Watson here uh, sexually assaulted multiple, multiple young kids in the San Bernardino Little League in California. And again, we handle cases out of state. And we went out there and, you know, it was just horrible what this Little League did. I mean, they basically wouldn't do background checks. And what we did was, in a lot of these cases, you know, people think, well, how can I bring a case against, you know, the so-and-so camp or the so-and-so little league? Well, a lot of these camps and little leagues, number one, have insurance. But number two, they're affiliated with the major outfit of that association. This case, they, they told the California lawyers, you know, we only have $300,000 in insurance. We're the local San Bernardino Little League. We're not affiliated with the major little league. Well, they had the symbol. They had all their handbooks. They had all their baseballs. They got their uniforms from them. They were. They were totally under the little league in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. 
And I flew up to Williamsport to take the president of the Little League's deposition. I had planned on taking his deposition for three hours or so. And my first question to him after I got his name was, why don't you do background checks on your volunteer coaches? And he said, because we wouldn't have many coaches apply. I said, okay, I don't have any more questions for you. And that was the end of that case. I was so proud of these two brothers that I represented, Jimmy and Garrett Hickman. They're only above money and everything else. Their only consideration for settlement was that the National Little League would institute a background check procedure requirement, and they agreed to do it in this case. And uh, they really made a difference by coming forward. And I know that all of you make that difference every single day in what you do. And I think we can empower victims tremendously through these cases. Um, I'm going to talk about domestic violence, and then I'm going to skip forward um, to human trafficking, because I know we're getting into our last half hour here. You know, I just did this presentation on this at the NCVBA conference in Denver. I think it is so critical that we, that civil lawyers represent domestic violence victims. And civil lawyers have really kind of stayed away from these cases because the defense is, well, hey, how are you going to stop the, the aggravated, insane, jealous ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, ex-wife um, from attacking their former lover because it's, so, it's a crime of passion. They're not going to be stopped by a security guard. And I totally disagree, and I do disagree for a number of reasons. Number one is domestic violence. Everybody's on notice, whether you run an apartment complex, a condominium, a shopping mall, or a restaurant. Everyone knows that domestic violence is a problem in our society, has been a problem for multiple decades, and is one of the most heated incidents you can have. And so, therefore, we're on notice of it. There's no excuse, oh, this is just going to happen. What are we going to do? We've been very successful in these cases, and this was a case where a woman, as all of you deal with domestic violence cases, got an injunction, went to live in an apartment complex she never thought her husband would find her at, lived under a pseudonym, went to this actual place because she was told they would have security and that they would have a gate access, and she lived under a pseudonym. Well, unfortunately, when her ex-husband was served with the injunction, the process server put her new address on it when he was supposed to white it out, obviously. So her husband comes here, goes through a unguarded entry in the middle of the night where it's raining, sat there for several hours right in front of her apartment complex where she was asleep with no parking decal, no tag that he would be required to have when she came out of her house got in her car, he shot her 17 times, killed her, and then he went and killed himself. And this case should have never happened. The apartment complex promised a gate and promised security, and the reason why is they had a crime problem there that they didn't tell her about or any other residents. That what was going on there, an abduction, all these other types of crimes. Um, they... Uh, talked about parking access system for people, that you will need to use your parking card to get in and out of the community. Well, they never even installed the gates. Um, they, they applied for the gates in December um, of 2003, and they weren't finished until right after this murder of her. So almost a year went by with no gates. They also cut their security guards uh, and didn't let anybody know about it. Here is a video of the assailant driving through open gates because they weren't finished yet. This is a night that there was a security guard on duty, but as you'll see in the surveillance, it was raining, so the security guard couldn't be troubled with going outside and doing her tours and seeing a car that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and the assailant was allowed to sit out there for three hours, commit this murder, and leave totally undetected. 
uh, and Denora left behind two uh, beautiful children. Um, you know, again, the assailant comes in at 510 and leaves at 632, an hour and a half on that particular property. We were able to get a result in a domestic violence case that a lot of people uh, didn't think was uh, possible. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to um, the human trafficking part of the uh, presentation. So if we can get out of that and... Sure, you should skip ahead. But while we're doing that, what I was going to talk to you about, which we're skipping over, is bank robbery cases, hotel cases, and affordable housing cases. And one thing, when Renee asked the question about sovereign immunity, you know, you, we used to deal with cases where um, HUD owned the actual, um, uh, the actual apartment complex. HUD has been getting out of own the government has been getting out of owning apartment complexes. And what they've been doing is going to an affordable housing model where private entities run government housing. So if you have a case where it happened at government housing, you're thinking, oh, wait, Mike said that might be sovereign immunity. Have a lawyer look at it, or I'd be glad to look at it. Because the government's gotten out of these. The folks that are getting into them um, are total slum wards. And they're doing it so that they get their money at the beginning of the year, and it's it's a it's an incredible money maker for them. So please don't uh, turn down those cases. But I want to talk to you for about 10 minutes before we do questions um, with regard to human trafficking, because this is something we all as a society need to stop. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing crimes in America. Traffickers often use legitimate businesses to carry out their heinous crimes. America's hotels are tackling this issue every day, training every hotel worker to combat trafficking, increasing our cooperation with law enforcement, partnering with national trafficking prevention organizations. We're taking a unified industry approach to save lives, leading the way in the travel industry. Learn more about our commitment. Well, only believe in the first part of that, um, because the hotel industry is in Atlanta today passing a bill to give immunity to hotels and other commercial entities for this tremendous problem. Uh, and the reason why is the hotel industry and others have turned a blind eye to this. And I'm going to skip through these slides. I mean, we I'm sure everybody on the phone knows that, that human trafficking – there's only one thing that is more illegally trafficked in the world than humans right now, and that's drugs. Um, and the reason why is, and this is a billion, billion dollar industry, because unfortunately, humans can be reused, whereas cocaine and heroin can't. And my point on this, and this presentation usually is, is uh, done for communities and leaders because we have to stop the commercial enterprises that are allowing this to happen. Because law enforcement is doing a much better job coming together with all the different alliances, federal, state, everyone working together. But once you arrest one human trafficker, another one's coming right behind because it is so profitable. And those of you who've dealt with this know the communication network, the logistic network of how they're moving survivors and human trafficking victims from state to state, from one massage parlor to another, from one motel to another, is mind-boggling with these operations. And they're going to continue unless we stop um, the folks that are allowing this to happen. I'm just going through the statistics. You know all these. It's not just females. It's not just minors. And it's not, like, a lot of people think just foreigners. These are domestic people. These are domestic victims that have occurred. Um, obviously, this is just going over the collaborative law enforcement. I'm going to skip over Ronald Reagan. But what the point of what I was I, I say in this presentation is that you know this is a lot like the war on drugs. I mean, once you arrest this drug dealer, what drug dealer comes in? Another one, another one. The same thing is occurring with traffickers. One goes to jail, the other one doesn't. This is all about location. 
if you are dealing with human, human trafficking victims, most likely they have been trafficked at a hotel, and they'll obviously a massage parlor, um, apartments, condominiums, truck stops, anything along those lines. Um, so again, my advice in these cases is when you have a human trafficking survivor, please talk to them obviously about where it happened in the minute there's a commercial entity involved, get someone who specializes in these cases involved. Because the only way we're going to stop it is by getting after Marriott in the courts, getting after you know whoever the hotel is, getting after whoever the strip mall owner is. We're bringing cases against strip mall owners who have massage parlors that it's obvious to know that what is going on. When you have multiple, multiple people coming to a hotel room um, or coming to the strip mall in droves, you, these folks know what is going on. And yes, we want the human trafficker, but that's not going to stop it. The only way to stop it is to take away their location. And these are examples of what is going on. The, 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 these truck stops, it's just horrible and chilling to read this of how Miners are walking through truck stops and seeing flashing lights and going visiting those trucks. And that these truck stops are absolutely negligent for allowing this to occur. Um, obviously, the problems in massage parlors, and again, anywhere that these have occurred, apartment complex, they're no different. Even though someone may lease an apartment comp, an apartment, when you there's no way a manager, a maintenance worker, anyone can't see multiple men visiting that ap apartment. And what happens here is that folks are paid off. Hotel maids are paid off, hotel managers, apartment managers are paid off, you know, and, and get a bonus on turning a blind eye to these incidents. You just look at these numbers that are kept. Cases of trafficking in hotels and motels, 1,400 right there. Again, we also, if you ever deal with labor trafficking, which is huge, um, those, those are cases as well. Um, again, human trafficking in the hotel industry, um, observations of suspicious activity at 19%. That should be at 80%, 90%. There's no way not to see this. Polaris, who is one of the leaders in education on human trafficking throughout the world, found that 80% of forced commercial sex acts occur in a motel or a hotel. And these, these civil cases are not being filed at the rate that they should have. And I can tell you, I could have said the same thing for negligent security cases 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, you know, we went to different organizations, lawyers talking about negligent security cases, and we're thrilled to see more of these cases have been brought on behalf of victims. Uh, budget motels were identified as the venue of choice for human trafficking. Uh, and obviously, we see these throughout whatever community that you're in. Uh, what I'm going to do is I've, I've got a number of slides on this. But if there are questions piling up, Renee, I think we should ask folks to start asking their questions. And then you can interrupt me when you're ready for me to start answering if there are some. All right, sounds good. We don't have any pending right now. We were knocking them out. So I would say if everyone wants to start asking questions, feel free and I, I will just rudely interrupt Mike from here on out. I appreciate it. <laughs> so what I'm gonna skip to here, um, and, and this is a slide, if you read this, sex trafficking victims accounts identified security failures and inadequacies that allow victims to either remain captive or meet with traffickers and customers at the budget motel. Victims were subject to roughly 10 to 20 violators per day. Each time the trafficker, victim, and violator entered and left the premises undetected. There's no way a hotel can't see that. And if they say they can't see that, I would try that case every day of the week and twice, twice on Sunday because it makes no sense. Um, as all of you know, dealing with these survivors in these cases, they are, they are difficult. 
They have been through the unthinkable. Um, the common person thinks that they're chained up at night, um, you know, that they have no freedom to go. We all know dealing with these cases that the coercion they've been through, the threats are both subtle but real. And uh, folk, you know, and I think juries are going to understand that. So don't, again, don't be worried. Don't think you are taking a lawyer's time by calling them or giving their number to a victim and saying, look, I'm a crime victim advocate. I'm a police officer. I'm a prosecutor. I don't know if you have a case or not, but I would go talk to somebody because you might have a case. And again, I think our threshold for that should be if it happens somewhere that's a commercial entity, have them go talk to a lawyer. I've never gotten upset ever at reviewing a case and being able to tell a victim whether they have a case or not because I feel they get some closure from that. Um, again, I mean, the, the statistics do not lie. 2,181 were identified as sex trafficking, and of those, 80% involved a hotel or a motel. Hey, Mike. Yes. We do have a question. Um, if you are familiar with applying the root, please weigh in on applying routine activity theory to to your efforts. Can you say that? Again? Please weigh in on applying the routine activity theory to your efforts. And that's from Philip Marshall at Beyond Brooks. So, Philip, can you can you clarify a little bit for me on what you'd like to know? Maybe. And would you want me to okay. keep going through this, Renee, while we wait, or? Yeah. Well, can you weigh in on the routine activity theory at all? I'm not sure what oh, that here means. Here we go. Okay. Philip, we'll come back to yours if you can clarify. We have another one. If a child is in the care of CFS, but they have a case, do they have to wait until they are no longer in the care of CFS to file that case? So family services. Sure. So I'm imagining that this is a case where a child might have been sexually assaulted or somehow become a victim while in the care of family, family services but then is relocated because they have nowhere to go. Um, they, they don't have to wait. Uh, that government entity certainly has a um, responsibility to them. Um, that would be something I would get to a lawyer right away so they can evaluate the statute of limitations. You know, the key there is who's gonna bring the case for a child. So I would definitely get them to a lawyer who would understand in that particular state and jurisdiction you know, how do I get a guardian ad litem appointed uh, who could bring the case for the child? And then that guardian ad litem obviously, you know, would retain the law firm and then the law firm would have to really understand the statute of limitations. Um, obviously, those cases may involve some sovereign immunity, but a lot of times, you know, there's been this move in our government to privatize and to use private companies. So anytime you think that there might be sovereign immunity, again, have a lawyer check, because a lot of those child services is all you know with whether it's someone going to rehab, someone going to different things, is run by private entities. So I would always check to see if there's a private entity. And a child's right, especially someone who obviously doesn't have parents uh, that have legal rights for them anymore, will have to get a guardian ad litem provided by the court, but those mechanisms are in place all across the country. We, we are going to talk about the routine activity theory offline a little bit. Um, so let's, let's move on. Okay. So I'm going through some, some different cases here that have involved um, hotels, uh, different places. Um, and, and these are a lot of the rest that you all have seen in, in, in your communities. And what I want to do is let's go through an example um, human trafficking case. There haven't been a lot of them yet. They're being filed, uh, they're being brought, but this is what it would look like. And if we're looking at our negligent security cases we talked about, you know, here's the front line. The folks at the front need to realize somebody paying in cash, is somebody renting a room, 
you know, uh, for certain periods of time. Uh, when they come in with someone, what's the age disparity? I mean, it's much like the airport. When you travel with a minor who doesn't have an ID, what does a TSA person say? Who are you traveling with? What's your name? Uh, all these hotel workers should be trained in that. You know, as, as a lot of you probably know from the Vegas shooting, uh, the mass shooting that happened out in Las Vegas, one of the things that the hotel industry changed is that there's no more put a do not disturb sign on your door for two days. Um, all hotels are now checking and going in rooms um, within a 24-hour period. And that is something that is huge in human trafficking because obviously the victims are put on drugs or given drugs continually. Uh, most of these cases, you know, the smell of marijuana is all throughout the room. Um, other issues, you know, throughout the room. So those so these people should be on a 24-hour notice figuring this out in hotels. Obviously, every hotel has surveillance videos, and they should be checked. And this is actual surveillance video of men waiting outside of rooms uh, to go in there, the, the victims in the right corner, walking through the hotel in the middle of the night on, uh, you know, obviously on drugs and those type of things. So I, I show all these different um hotel folks because every single employee in a hotel is their eyes and ears and they are responsible for it. um so what's going on in room 206 21 day rental that's a red flag different guests always inquiring about the room different men as visitors the room smells of marijuana don't you want to check that out refusing cleaning service for several days um, obviously, do not disturb sign can't be posted more than 24 hours, but all the time. Uh, and then obviously a minor victim not allowed to leave the room. You know, these, these cases are, I would argue, are more easily recognizable than even negligent security cases from the lawyer standpoint. So please, when involved in these, get them to someone. And this is a case that's been filed in Jacksonville against the Roosevelt Inn up there, and it's pending litigation right now and several states have um pennsylvania has really um has the best law in the books right now it's passed a couple of years ago to not just criminalize human trafficking but put a civil component in that holds commercial entities responsible for it and um it's really simple negligence the acts and omissions of employees I mean, employees control the premises, whether you're in a Holiday Inn Express, whatever it is, those employees are in control, and they have a unique position to observe. They never leave. Um, if you fail to report observation of any of these signs of human sex trafficking, that is negligence. And, you know, the bottom line is that they receive money from this. Even if they're not getting kickbacks and bribes, they're making money from that room rental, and they're financially profiting from the act of human trafficking. And that's a huge element here. Uh, they just knew or should have known what was going on in that room. And that, that's about as simple as it gets. Uh, this again is the Pennsylvania's comprehensive anti-tracking legislation. Uh, and it's excellent. Uh, so if you're in Pennsylvania, you're in a good place. If you're not, you know, you gotta watch what's going on in Georgia. They've tried to do it in Florida to us the last three years. We've tried to pass a proactive human trafficking bill to codify and put into the law, um, holding commercial uh, entities responsible. We don't, I don't think you need it, um, but they've tried to put in immunity each year and we've killed our own bill to protect victims. Uh, and, you know, and, and this, this is just the bottom line. Hotels are the key. They really are the front line in the fight to end human trafficking. And we're not gonna do it without them being responsible and changing their ways. And I just quote here something that the enemy numbers do not matter if you don't take their coveted territory. The bottom line is if we're gonna allow these um, hotels and other entities to keep doing this, you can put you can put 100 human traffickers in jail tomorrow. It's not gonna matter. Somebody else is gonna come up and do it. It's too profitable. There's too much money to make. Um, and so, I can't thank you all enough for being on this call with me, being on this seminar. I hope you, you got some things out of it. I, you know, again, if you ever need to contact me, my email 
uh, is mah at haggardlawfirm.com. Uh, for anything, don't ever hesitate. We're all in this together. And I just can't thank you enough for what you do every day. You're the true heroes out there and making a difference for victims every day. I can't tell you how many times our clients have expressed their thankfulness for the folks they meet uh, through their criminal justice uh, journey. So thank you very much. And I'll answer any other questions. So um, Mike, can you reread your email again slowly for everyone? Sure. Uh, it's M-A-H um, at Haggard, H-A-G-G-A-R-D, law firm, all one word, dot com. And my so phone number is three. Oh, I'll ahead. just give it to everybody. My, my office number is 305-446-5700. So just so everybody knows, a copy of this video we've been recording, this will be on the National Crime Victim Bar Association page. That web address is victimbar.org. So if you want to go back through or see things, um, we would love your feedback. Again, this is a new series we're going to do. So we will be having different attorneys weigh in on different topics. Um, they will be monthly at the same time. And next Next month is April 7th. It will be on nursing home and, and injuries that happen in nursing homes. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you have any, please email it to Megan Bahanero, who set this all up, and she will forward it to us. And thanks, and we will talk to you next month. And thank you so much, Mike. You got it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone.